Hello, and thank you all for being with us today. I represent the Buying Agents Association of India, which was created just four years ago to meet the needs of buying uh, agents and liaison offices across India to allow us to work together to improve industry standards and promote the growth of exports. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to Global Sources for inviting us to share this platform. We are honored to be presenting alongside so many industry experts. Today, we would like to talk you through some key points about sourcing from India in today's day and age, especially post COVID-19, we believe that handcrafted products will truly come into their own. India is a unique sourcing destination. It caters to a breadth of customers from the mass market to the designer, from e-commerce to specialty retailer. Everyone from Walmart to Michael Aram, Ralph Lauren, Amazon to Anthropology and Crate and Barrel are buying products from India. I'm now going to show three short videos that truly demonstrate the uniqueness that is India. India is truly a unique blend of the old and the new in terms of its manufacturing. Here we see the metal skills in the city of Muradabad where they are creating beautiful objects that can be found in any modern home. Here you see traditional metal hammering um, it is literally hand hammered. Here is uh, brass being weighed and here is a handle being soldered onto a jug. All by hand. And yet, when you see this finished product, it's quite beautiful. This second video is also set in the city of Muradabad. And we are showing you the opposite side of the spectrum. This is a large organized factory, extensively mechanized, which handles multiple materials, iron and steel, glass, wood, different types of wood, mango, shisham, pine, which is important, bleach, which is imported, um, stone, this is marble cutting here, they do marble, granite, sandstone, and slate, as well as limestone. This factory has a very large in-house testing lab that can cater to most international clients' demands and certification. This is truly an example of how India can grow its manufacturing capacity with investment and the right technology. Likewise, in the textile sector, we have many large mills for terry tiles, bed linen, and fabric yardage for apparel and home. This, as you can see, is a large, clean, modern, state-of-the-art factory that could be anywhere in the world. And it is a great example of the scale and capacity expansion that is happening in India with technology and investment. So India is a production hub, let's talk about that. Within the scope of our BAA activity, apparel is the largest category of product with almost 15.5 million uh, billion exported in 1819, followed closely by pharmaceuticals and tea, coffee, spices and rice. In reality, the pharmaceutical and food production sectors are much less dependent on our services due to the nature of their industry and the fact that they already have long-standing and established markets outside India. These are also areas where technology and investment has already happened. So much of our focus is the micro, small and medium enterprises, the MSME sector as it's known here, which is also highly labor intensive. After apparel, MSME exports amounted to almost 13.5 billion last year, which includes leather goods, handicrafts, home textiles, carpets, and stainless steel housewares. In order to grow our manufacturing for export, we need to encourage investment in the sector, and we also need the government to help de develop our infrastructure. 
We believe that in the post-COVID-19 scenario, India will see significant changes in how our government lifts controls and allows ease of doing business. Home and apparel are two key sectors, and we believe that with the right investment and focus, they can become very large uh, part of our exports. Our focus today uh, is going to, however, be on the handcrafted sector, be it apparel, home decor, fashion accessories or carpets, there is potential for handcraft in all of them. We would like to tell you the story of India. India, a profitable destination for sourcing handicrafts? Indeed, um, employment in the handicraft sector, largely in smaller towns uh, outside the big cities, provides a regular income to people in the rural areas who have uh, agricultural uh, responsibilities, so they have dual income. Um, handicrafts are an important owner of foreign exchange, as we have seen. Um, they have moved with the times. There has been innovation to cater with uh, new designs. There is considerable flexibility here, allowing for lower MOQs. Consumers in developed countries are actively looking for handmade product now. They do want to know how that product is made. The use of mixed materials in the sector, even recycling metal, glass, from different sources helps to create the product story. And we believe that that is what our customer is going to be looking for. India today is still a country of skilled artisans who have preserved their crafts for hundreds of years. And all these crafts are alive today largely because of the export demand. Our exports from these sectors are over 5 billion annually. We believe that it is essential to encourage and grow our handicraft sector as this is what, in a post-COVID-19 world, people will actually care about. This map shows the ge geographic distribution of many of our textile crafts, which have developed for historical reasons. For example, the Mughals were great patrons of embroidery, stone, and metalworking, uh, which is prevalent even today in the state of Uttar Pradesh. Here we have sand casting. Um, the molten metal is poured into a mold created in sand. So each mold gets broken after the product is made. This involves several skilled artisans to produce the product. Here are some of the examples of the product. Beadwork. This is surface ornamentation done on fabric on a, an udda. So here you see them tracing the design on paper, which is then marked so that the uh, imprint can go through the paper, through the dots on the paper, and put a washable blueprint, as it were, on the base fabric, which is stretched on the frame, the udda. And here the artisan is picking the beads and following a pattern that has been given to him. And slowly but surely, the design emerges and the finished product is going to be a beautiful placemat or centerpiece that will be sold in high-end boutiques across the globe. Next, we have glass blowing, where molten glass is blown into iron molds to create the shape. This is, can only be done by mouth. So it's a handicraft. Some of the surface decoration is cut by hand. There is a certain amount of etching done. Otherwise, the pieces themselves are beautiful and organic and um, totally handmade. Metal hammering, you've seen the uh, first video which showed exactly how this technique was done. So I don't think we need to dwell on this one. And here are some of the products available in stores across the world, which are hand hammered in India. Papier-mâché, this is a very um, unique craft um, where paper pulp is shaped over molds by hand to create the uh, shape of the object. It's then hand-painted. Um, this product is largely made in Kashmir, but there are more rustic papier-mâché uh, small production done in Gujarat and in Rajasthan. Here are some of the products. Wood carving. Wood carving is a 
huge cottage industry for India. Um, the artisans work in small units in a uh, couple of small towns, again in uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, quite a lot of the artisans have also migrated to different areas because there is such high demand, both for the export market as well as for the uh, local market. And if we go to the next slide, we can see some of the beautiful products that are available in the world outside India today, and they are really truly incredible pieces of art. Carpet weaving. Carpets are a huge part of Indian handicraft exports. Um, many states of India uh, produce carpets and the um, export volume is about $1.5 billion today. Um, India is the largest weaver of handmade carpets in the world and I think we need to really see how we can preserve this handicraft. Applique work, this is a smaller, more village uh, craft production, largely done by the women, where um, pieces of fabric are cut by hand and then stitched by hand over a base fabric uh, to a pattern, but they can all actually do quite large production. Um, there are many, many women in the villages who have uh, small holdings, they do some housework, some agricultural work, and then they sit and they do the applique work. So actually, it's quite scalable. And here are some of the products, uh, some apparel, um, curtains, and a decorative cushion. Kanta embroidery. So this is a running stitch, which is done by hand. It's a very old traditional stitch, originated in um, East and well, it originated in the state of Bengal, which is now East Bengal, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, West Bengal, which is in India. And it was really um, the idea behind Kanta was um, to turn old clothes into functional objects, into blankets. Largely, old saris and dupattas were converted. Now, as you can see, it is widely used in home decor, beautiful quilts, cushions, and even jackets. Chicken curry. This is a very special craft, which is found in a small region, actually, and directly, um, you know, descendant of the uh, Mughal patronage. Um, this is predominantly in the city of Lucknow and around it, which is in the state of UP. The pattern is printed with a hand block onto fabric. The uh, fabric is then issued out to the uh, women in different villages where they do the hand embroidery in the small uh, wooden frame and it's like a shadow stitch so the embroidery is actually on the back of the fabric and you see it coming through and it's it's exquisite. Here are some uh, pieces of clothes um, which you know it's 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 a wonderful craft. Block printing everybody loves a bit of block printing um, the blocks are hand carved uh, on wood this is a complete art craft all on its own um, each block in a design is created, um, each color in a design is created by a different block and complex patterns can uh, involve 8 to 10, maybe even 12 blocks. Here you see the dye stuff being placed in trays with layers of coarse fabric to allow only the right amount of color to adhere to the block so that it's not blobby on the fabric. So as you can see, the pressure applied by the printer is, is a skill that is learned over the years, and it's a skill that we really need to preserve. That's the silver color, it's going to go on top of the gold there. And look at that, beautiful, beautiful, on gorgeous um, linen background. Khadi weaving. I think Khadi needs no introduction. Uh, it was uh, started by Mahatma Gandhi in 1918 as a protest against the British imports of cotton fabric from the mills in, Eng in England. And he said, we will weave our own fabric. They had no technology, they had no um, equipment to, to weave sophisticated uh, fine yarn. So they wove this hand spun yarn, which is the Kadi, and it is still woven and um, uh, it is still spun and woven today. And we have absolutely beautiful fabrics. Um, and the, uh, it has a beautiful slubby texture from the hand spun yarn. And the more it is washed, the softer the hand feels. So it, it makes a really gorgeous throw, a really gorgeous soft um, garment to wear at night or for casual, casual living. Here we have uh, a very recent quote by the fashion designer Sabia Sachi. 
where he says, nations with an authentic craft heritage will rise up to create new and meaningful economies. Handmade in India. I think he says it all. So here we have a sort of quick SWOT analysis for the handicraft and apparel sector. Um, I'm not going to read through every point because I think you will be reading quicker than I'm speaking. One of India's great strengths is the availability of raw material, which leads to the ability to create mixed media products for the home. And even for apparel, we have um, natural fiber bags with embroidery on them, natural fiber um, tote bags with leather handles, with um, you know, raffia woven bags. So there's, there's a huge variety of um, materials that are being used with wooden handles. In India, we have um, a very young population, so a large workforce, and English language is widely spoken, so communication um, is easy. There is a high, going to be a high demand for handicrafts. We, we, we see that happening. Um, there's also, I think, a great move to move away dependency, particularly on China, for uh, production. Um, I would say that India, as you've seen from our numbers, we're quite far away from filling that gap. But I believe with uh, government engagement and investment, India will start to catch up on um, on the manufactured sector. On the handcrafted sector, I think, we, I think we own that territory and we need to make it better. And um, there, is, there is a way for us to really grow our exports using our handcraft and um, utilizing, utilizing the skills that we have. Our current share of global trade is very low, so there's great opportunity there. And our labor cost, is significantly lower than China and Vietnam. So um, I think this is the time to look at India and see what India can do and what India can do better um, with investment and with technology. So post-pandemic, let's tell the India story. As the world emerges from this pandemic, we see all of these as a good reason for buyers to look at India. India will become a more important destination for smart sourcing. We believe that people are going to change how they consume and therefore how they buy. Many customers now want to know the story, be it craft or social responsibility or sustainability. That is what's going to matter. India already has many organizations supporting our artisans and we are also a leader in organic farming. Here are some slides to show you where we think that India can be an important sourcing destination for the mindful consumer. As you can see, many brands, um, Target, H&M, Muji, to mention just a few here, are already very aware of how they source and how they market these products to the end consumer. Dining and cooking together. If you're following WGSN, you will know that in these times of global lockdown, many families are cooking together and spending more time eating together. This is expected to be a continuing trend. India is an important producer of sustainable kitchen products, tabletop products in steel, glass, wood, or ceramics, and we think that this is a huge opportunity. The artisan story. Once again, it's a story that matters. Acknowledge the artisan and make sure that some of the profits from your business are going back to the communities who provide the work, people, the workforce for your products. Customers want to know about this, so share it with your customers. With e-commerce growing year on year, it is so easy to tell this story. India is the home of Ayurveda, and yet we're not really a major exporter of Ayurvedic products. And this is definitely an area to explore. Some of the Ayurvedic or natural personal care brands that exist in the domestic market are Kama, Forest Essentials, Kadi, Padi Local, Fab India, and quite a few others. We do see that this is a very, very important area to grow. Obviously, there are some testing requirements, labeling requirements that need to be met. But that's, again, where we as buying agents can probably play an important role in educating the um, producers here in how to meet the demands of the outside world. Yoga, already a major export from India. And I think during lockdown, many of us have realized the possibility of practicing our yoga online. We have healthy tea 
and snacks, which are readily available here in India. I think now is the time to explore how we can export them. This quote, quote by Lee Edelcourt, trend forecaster, we can see that with our vastly divergent product categories and possibilities for unique combinations, India will not only survive, it's going to become more and more important for sourcing product here. To conclude our talk here today, we would like to give you some pointers on how to access India as a foreign buyer. A good way to start is to visit one of the many trade shows here in India. Some of the bigger ones are the Delhi Fair, the, International, the India International Garment Fair, Home Expo, India Knit Fair, India Textile Sourcing Fair, and Gartex India. You can also contact the dedicated Product Export Promotion Councils directly. We're listing the major ones associated with our industries in our index, and we're giving you the website references. We at the BAA are also here to help you with your sourcing needs. We are a large group of dedicated professionals who are geared to demystifying India. I recommend that you do link up with a sourcing partner on the ground here. We are able to bridge the gap and help facilitate the buying process. We can do quality control, production management, as well as help with testing and compliance. Many of us have in-house design studios and can help with on-the-ground interpretation of clients' briefs. In short, we aim to be your eyes and ears on the ground in India. BAA does also believe the story matters and we would be more than happy to take you to the source of each story. We'd like to acknowledge the help and inputs uh, from these partners here. And I'd like to say a special thank you to the teams at BAA and Indian Inc. for working overtime to put all this data together. Thank you too to Caroline Young, who's an India-based India design consultant for her inputs today. Here's our index, which I hope will give you some useful links um, into all the people who we have mentioned in today's presentation. Thank you very much.